part two. Good night. You need another song? Yeah. Let us know the page uh, page twenty five and I sunk with me in the book. Page twenty five. I keep falling in love with him over and over.
of troubled restlessness, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep going, verse 9 as well. Okay. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power? Okay, we're going to break these concepts down of what God is actually saying through the Apostle Paul's ministry in 2 Thessalonians, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 6 to verse number 9. And of course, we thank the birthday girl for reading for us, and Sister Janice as well. So I put her on the spot just for a minute. <laughs> All right. Now, there's several things that 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6 to verse number 9 teaches us. Number one, if you don't know this by now, it already declares to us that Christians are going to have some enemies. There are going to be people that just hate you for your faith, hate you for who you are, hate you that you do exemplify. Matthew 5, verse number 16, folks, which says what? Let your light so shine before the world that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. That's only for people that are honest, right? People that are honest want to see the Jesus in you, right? But people that hate Jesus don't want to see him nor you, right? Because you're a mirror image of him. And it's not just that they all, they'll talk about you behind your back or sabotage or even talk in your face. Sometimes they get to the point it's even violent, right? Because we do have people that have died because of their faith. You know, remember the, the probably the most famous one other than Jesus himself was what? Stephen. And that's chapter number seven. And so God is saying, look, even Stephen is going to be avenged. Remember what did God say? Uh, we're not supposed to take revenge, because vengeance belongs to the Lord. And that's when God is actually going to exact vengeance on a whole lot of people for persecuting his church, also known as the children of God, also known as Christians, also known as you, that are faithful in the Lord. Okay? And so that's what he was doing. He was trying to send some comfort to the Christians that were in Thessalonica, because they were under persecution. Because of their faith, people were doing things to them, mistreating them. Don't worry about it. God's got it un under control. In his time, all this stuff is going to come back to the enemies of the Lord, okay? Which are the enemies of his people. That's why he's saying what? Rest with us. Have some peace in your spirit. Because there's going to be coming a day of reckoning that God is going to execute upon the enemies of his church. Okay? All right? Now, remember we talked about him last time, God doesn't want anybody to perish, right? We're talking about going to H-E double hockey sticks. There's not a way to execute these things, because why? He's trying to give people a chance to repent. Repent first, okay? So that's why we do Matthew 5, verse 44, right? Where God said, what, love your enemies? Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that spitefully use you, so forth and so on, right? Because why? We don't even want to see that day happen to people, do we? we rather see them, even if they're our enemies, turn so they don't have to face the angry face of God, right? Or the wrath of his power that is to come upon the earth. Okay, that makes sense to you? So now you see, remember... Any time that you're studying the book of the Bible, remember we talk about hermeneutics all the time, right? It's how to rightly interpret the Bible. What do you do? You what? Read above? Below. Read below. And you also figure out why was this written in the first place, right? Uh, Paul was writing to a persecuted church. And so he had to say some things to what? Encourage them, okay? And this is part of the encouragement for those that live then and also what? Those that live now, okay? Because God's word is eternal and will never pass away. Okay, so don't, don't be surprised by that, right? Because the more that you live right, the more enemies you're going to make. I mean, it's just the truth, right? And remember, I'm not saying make enemies because of evil within you, but you're going to make enemies because of what? Good. That's in you, right? So if you again, we like to always make the analogy that if everybody in this world is your friend, something's wrong. Right? Because why? You're making some compromises on some things that you should not, right? In order to please folks, to keep them smiling instead of what? God smiling. And folks that are evil, don't hide behind this statement. You know, if you hate it, sometimes folks are hated for a reason, right? But if you're going to suffer, the Bible says what? Suffer as a 
Christian, right? When it comes to persecution. All right, that makes sense to you. All right, any questions or comments on it? Now, again, this goes all against TV preacher, don't it? Remember, TV preacher talking about everything going to be all right. You'll never have no problems. I want to know what book they're reading. Because it's surely not the Bible. It's about persecution, right? And so how you have to endure. Remember, that's what Revelation 2, verse 10 is talking about. It's, it was talking to the church then that you're going to go through some things. But what did Jesus still require? Revelation 2, verse 10 says what? Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a what? Crown of life. Hmm? I mean, I don't even know if there have been any Christians in the first century that would have listened to this TV preacher today. Because all of them was under persecution. You know what I mean? They were really catching it because of their faith. Who dragged to prison? So tell me that just because you're a Christian, everything's going to be an easy road. God never said that in the first place, did he? Why did Jesus have to say then, if that was the case, if any man be my disciple, that he deny himself, pick up his cross, and what? Follow me. He did not say, if any man be my disciple, that he deny himself, pick up his prosperity. <laughs> That's what's preached today. Hmm? And follow me. It's not there. In other words, he's going to have some rough days, right? But he still says what? Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. That's when the prosperity actually begins, when you're in the heavenly glory, not the earthly beings that we're down here right now, or earthly realm that we're in right now. Okay? That makes sense to you. See, sometimes we just need a shot in the arm of reality, don't we? Otherwise, we'll never stay faithful to God if we are, like we like to say, so pie in the sky, right? No, no. The gospel don't have to be sold. The gospel needs to be told. And that's going to be what? Good and bad. Tough and easy. Just depend on the day. But at the end of the day, we know that Jesus said what? The Holy Spirit said what? I'll never leave thee, nor will I forsake thee. In other words, he will get you through these times. And in his time, right? He's going to make everything right on the judgment day. Okay? All right. That makes sense? All right. Now, on that judgment day, which we're again going back to 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1, 6, verse number 9. Jesus, every time you talk about the judgment scene, he's always accompanied by angels. Right? And again, we know how powerful angels are, right? We use the example of Sodom and Gomorrah. How many angels that walk through there? Two, right? And so if two can destroy a town, hmm, what can a legion of angels do? An army of them do. So if they can devastate a city by two, if he's coming back with multiple angels, he can definitely devastate an earth. The whole thing, right? Because they're always going to be more powerful than us any day of the week. As far as that ability and power, angels are a higher creation than we are. And so that's why God can use them as enforcers in order to take people to either what? The final destination of heaven or eternal punishment. Okay? They are the enforcers. Okay? All right, make sense to you. Remember, that's why Jesus can say this. Remember he said in Matthew 28, verse 18 to verse number 20, all power is given unto me in what? Heaven and in earth, right? So he's one example of that. And what? Everything living in this earth. Okay? All right. So if you have any doubts of his, of his power, you're going to see it in action on your own, right? Every eye is going to see him when he comes back and witness these things, okay? That makes sense to you? All right. All right. Any questions or comments before we move on? Y'all not scared, are you? You ought to be joyful right now because that's what you mean. That's what it means to be what? Saved. That you don't have to go through these things. Destruction to the wicked, Okay? And of course, this time, even as 2 Peter has shown us, remember 2 Peter chapter 3, all the scriptures are going to coordinate with each other, right? They're not going to contradict each other. And so if it was fire in 2 Peter, what is it going to be in 2 Thessalonians? Fire. Fire, right? Because God can't lie. He does not contradict himself. And so that means what? The destruction of the earth is going to be with fire. Same story. 
But this time told in what? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6 to verse number 9. For the medium destruction of the earth, destruction of the earth that we already have studied. And as we continue to go through scriptures, if good Lord let us continue to meet to do this, you're going to see the same thing. Fire, fire, fire. Melting. Dissolve. All that comes from what? Excessive heat. However God is going to do it at the uh, last day. All right? Remember, he always calls it what? The day of the Lord. So that's going to be the end. Okay? All right. Any questions or comments? Yes. So notice, when you look at that and you read the scripture before we got into our study then, notice those are, are destroyed are going to be those without a relationship with Christ, right? Remember, what did Jesus say? Now, when you study all of this, you got to understand how the scriptures harmonize, right? What did John 14, 6 say? We talk about it every week. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. That which gives life, right? Life means what? The ones that won't be destroyed. They will have eternal life. So you know this, right? So when he talks about salvation, he says what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming unto the Father, what? But by me. So these people being destroyed here cannot come unto the Father. And 2 Thessalonians is going to actually show you this as we continue to study that. Okay? All right? Now the folks that are being destroyed, they are those who do not obey the gospel. Now notice I didn't say did not believe. I said do not obey. 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 So obviously you do have to believe, but you also have to obey as well, all right? What does James chapter 2 verse 20 say, right? What does it say? It says what? Faith without works, which means the obedience to God's word. Faith without works is what? Dead. It cannot save you, right? So there's a, there's a difference between a saving faith and a dead faith, right? A dead faith has no obedience, no commitment to God at all, right? But a saving faith is one that is a James chapter 2, verse 20 faith, right? Faith without works is dead. In other words, you have to have both of them in order to avoid all this stuff that we've been talking about as far as the judgment day, which would be the perdition and the destruction of evil men. Now, obviously then we know what that is, right? Romans 10, 17, what's that plan of salvation to keep you out of this stuff? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the what? Word of God, right? You gotta actively have an open heart to what God has to say. Be exposed to the gospel, okay? Because why? Your heart has to be open in a way for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoso believed in him shall not perish, but have everlasting, everlasting life. That's the belief part. So yes, you gotta believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. You gotta believe he's the one that can keep you out of this mess, right? Keep you out of all the deeds that are going to destroy man. He is the one, the son of God is the one that what? Will save you. You know, that's why he is called in Acts chapter number two, what? Lord and Christ. See, most people just want the Christ part of him. But what? King. Right? Means boss. The one that we have to obey means we have to follow, right? He is the Christ, which means the Savior, the Deliverer, right? But again, what is he called? He's called what? Both Lord and Christ, right? So that's why believers have to be twofold, right? They have to be what? Believers and followers through obedience to be saved, right? So we cannot accept Jesus as our Savior without accepting him also as one and the same. same. Okay? All right? Any questions or comments on that? Yes, sir. Uh, John 14, 4 says, um, keep your love and keep my commandments. Yeah. Simple as that, right? It's, a, it's an expression of our love to keep. His commandments, right? All right. So obviously, then, he didn't just say, believe in me. He didn't say, just accept me as Savior. He said, what? If you love me, keep my commandments, right? Now, 14, verse number four. That's a hard point to get in the world because they have been so brainwashed by TV preaching that leaves out all the obedience stuff, right? But obedience is just as important as faith. 
You can't place one over the other because you've got to have both of them in order to be saved. Okay? Make sense to you? All right. I know people want your veterans and what I'm saying there, but we can't assume knowledge, right? We've got to make sure it's all taught. So again, you got to hear the word of God. Romans 10, 17. You've got to believe it. John 3, verse 7, 16. About Jesus being what? Lord in Christ, which equates to the same. One title. He's the Son in Christ, right? Then you got to do what? Acts 2, verse 38 says what? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, right? In the name of Jesus Christ for the what? The remission of your sins, meaning the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ghost, right? So that's when God's words start talking about the obedience, right? Because it makes logical sense, right? If you believe truly that he's the son of God, you will have no problem obeying him, right? And what did he tell us to do? Through his apostle, in this case, what? Repent, right? And then, of course, baptize. We just haven't got to that part yet, right? So if you're a true believer, you believe all the word of God, don't you? You won't leave one aspect of it undone and say, I'm saved. You can't do that, right? Because again, what is he? Lord and Christ. You gotta accept both aspects of Jesus, right? In order to be saved, okay? All right, then after that, what do you gotta do? Confess him, right? To be saved, right? But Romans 10, verse 9, verse 10 says, What with the mouth? Confession is made unto salvation, right? So Jesus Christ is the Son of God, which again is what? The one that ushered from G uh, the Father directly, right? And he is, that title pertains to him being what? Lord and Christ. Okay? And you have to tell somebody that, right? You have to make that confession before Jesus will save you. And of course, you got to go down in the water very with baptism. That's the obedience part as well, right? Obedience starts with what? Repentance, confession, and baptism. That's part of the obedience that he asked for, for him to truly be the Lord and Savior. Of your life. Because what did he say in Mark 16, verse 16? He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. In other words, he's going to go through all this stuff in 2 Thessalonians. Right? Not only the physical side of he's living at that time, but also the what? Eternal side of it. Right? Okay? All right. And of course, Revelation 2, verse 10, that's the continual obedience. Right? After you become a Christian, Jesus said, What? Be thou faith unto death. And I will give thee a what? Crown of life. Okay. I think that's a good interlude and intermission between all the judgment stuff that we're talking about. No reason just teaching about the judgment and not teaching how to get out of it, right? How to be delivered from the same. And that's it, right? Hear the word, believe it, repent, confess Jesus the Son of God, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. You'll be saved if you stay faithful unto death. That's how you get out of it. All the horrible sights and things that we're about to we're continue to study this second week of the second coming of Christ. Okay, it makes sense to you. All right. Are you able to articulate this to somebody now? If somebody asks you what what I do what do I need to do to be saved, can you deliver that to them? And then if they ask the question, what am I being saved from? Now you can articulate that now, right? You can talk about the judgment day. Not just the day on earth, but the what? The eternal day, right? That's coming for those that will be consigned to eternal punishment. All right. Any questions or comments on that? All right. Let's move on then. We're going to get deeper then. Now, again, going back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 60, verse number 9, that you had already read, what you're finding out that the punishment will be forever and will include eternal separation from God and not being able to come into the presence of of his mighty power anymore. All right, let's go back. I want to look at that real quick. Let's see. I want to see something real quick. All right. Look at verse 9. This is what it's talking about. This eliminates purgatory. You know the Catholic doctrine of purgatory? Well, they say, oh, God will punish you for a little while, then he'll let you leave. No. No. <laughs> or you can be prayed out. The Bible don't teach that at all. You will never find purgatory, temporary punishment at all when it comes to the afterlife. Why? Look at the verse. Now remember, we're talking about those that will be judged. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, verse 9. Who shall be punished with what? Ever. Tell me when ever, everlasting ends. Only. 
There is no end. Everlasting destruction. When God uses the term destruction and death and all that, when he's talking about the afterlife, it means what? Separation from him forever. And so you only got two options after the judgment day. It's either going to be heaven where God is or hell, also called destruction, also called the second death in the afterlife, right? And God says what? That destruction or that status of being in hell is how long? Everlasting, meaning what? Without end. It will not stop. Okay? And I want to wish that on my other, uh, on, excuse me, uh, on my uh, worst enemy. From what? From the presence of the Lord. So in other words, they'll never see God. Okay? They'll never see God after death. They're on their own. Okay? And from the glory of his power. What is the glory of his power? This is the part that kills purgatory. What is God's power to do for man? Save him. Save him. That's what, exactly what it means. So they'll what? They'll be what? Punished with everlasting destruction from the power, from the presence of the Lord, and from the opportunity again to be saved. Ever. Hmm? That's how final the judgment actually is. This is a scary thought. It is. They say there will be no way out of hell, no way, no how. No opportunity to come to God and, and all that kind of stuff. It's the end. Okay? And that's the part that people are not taking serious. Okay? There is no second chance after death. Remember, we used the example last time. How many days does God have to give us in this world? You know, think about it. If you live in your 40s and 50s, you've had thousands of times to be saved. So there's really no excuse. There isn't. I mean, it's just man being stubborn as old mute, right? And not coming to Christ, believing or obeying him like they should, and it results in what? Everlasting punishment. Okay? All right, make sense? All right. Anybody had a hand up? I'm going to make sure I miss you. All right. So that's the finality of it. So don't, don't, don't believe no Vatican nothing because they don't know what they talking about, okay? It's talking, as we like to say in our old slang, they're just talking out the side of their mouth, right? Doing nothing but lying, okay? So the Bible don't teach that. All right, let's go back to the slide then. Y'all quiet today. I don't know what it is. Is it the lesson getting you? <laughs> All right, I'm just messing with you. All right, let's go back to the slide I was at. All right, so that's what you learned from 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, verse 9. Again, punishment will be able to come into the presence of his mighty power, meaning his power to save them any further. Okay? That means that all hope for salvation for the lost is gone at the second coming. Okay? Now you see what Second Peter was talking about, right? That the Lord is not slack about his promise, right? He is going to send Jesus back. But what was he doing? Trying to hold all this off. Right? So that more people have an opportunity to avoid eternal punishment because of what? Jesus Christ. Okay? See, all of us got to harmonize, right? In order to be the correct teaching on the second coming of Christ Jesus. All right, any other questions or comments? All right, if not, I think we got time to get John chapter 5 in. All right, so again, we're still talking about John chapter 5, uh, excuse me, the second coming. But out of John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, what you find out, the more scriptures you study on the second coming, a little more detail comes, right? So you get a little bit here, a little bit there, and then you put the whole story, but it gives even more detail. And we're going to stay that more in, in depth as we go along. All right, somebody read John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. This is Jesus himself uh, as told by the apostle John. Now remember, the scriptures we studied last time and this time came from Paul's ministry. But you, you see they're going to harmonize because why? They have the same Holy Spirit. The same God working in them, revealing the same word. That's why the Bible is complete without error. Okay? All right. Somebody read John 5, verse 20. In which all that are in the graves 
shall hear his voice, and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Okay, now remember, these are the words of the Lord that sent These are the words of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So this happened before 2 Peter and 2 Thessalonians even written, right? And so remember, all the apostles is doing is bringing back the teachings of Jesus himself. Okay? That's why everything what, harmonizes with each other. Okay? All right. So again, what is it saying? The time will come that all the dead are going to hear the voice of Jesus at his second coming. So that means folks that did not want to read no Bible, didn't want to hear nothing about Jesus, didn't want to hear him say anything, speak to him through the word, anything like that, they're going to hear his voice anyway. Right? So you might as well learn it now so you're learning in peace, right? Because it, every voice is going to hear him. Can that make sense? So when that's why I say all the time, you're never fooled by people like David Koresh that has gone on, or, or all the people over the century that claim to be Jesus. Why? I never heard their voice. I'm talking about real life. I'm not talking about TV documentaries, right? It says what? When he comes back, everybody's going to hear his voice. All of us, you know, I'm using a silly example. All of us are going to figure out, did Jesus sound like a bass? Did he sound like a soprano? You know what I mean? We're going to be able to really describe his voice because why? We're going to literally hear it. Okay? And so when he comes back, you won't have to worry about no imposters. Mm -hmm. Fooling. I should be scared of that when I'm a kid. And so you're about, I'm like, how am I going to know it's the real one? Yeah. When he comes back. Well, there's a better way than even his voice, right? All the gray hair is going to clear out. Hmm? That means there will be not a dead person, period, right? Because everybody, for, so, so for all those imposters that came back saying, I'm Jesus, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Savior, nobody in the grave got up. <laughs> so you ought to know that he wasn't the real deal, right? He's got to be able to have that Lazarus thing going on, right? Lazarus, come forth. You ought to be able to do that, right? If he's truly Jesus Christ, right? Because that power will be shown. Because nobody will be able to resist it. Everybody will be able to hear it. And everybody that's already dead is going to what? Get pronounced. When we study Revelation chapter number 20, which is really the next scripture after John 5. John 5 kind of gives an overview of the resurrection day, which is the same day as what? The day of the Lord. The same day as the second coming. same day as the what? Judgment day, okay? But this is kind of more of an overview, right? So obviously then, for people to hear the voice of Jesus at the second coming has to be a miracle. Literally, not only because they, what, get out of the grave, but so that somebody here in Gaston will hear his voice, or somebody in Biloxi, Mississippi, in Egypt, you know, somebody in Rome, everybody's going to hear it across the entire planet. So that's some power. I'm not even talking about the resurrection of people here. No, I'm just talking about just hearing a voice. Everybody's going to hear it. And what? Come forth from the grave. That's some power, right? That, I mean, could you imagine just dirt moving, whatever the case, how it's going, going to be? I don't know what it's going to look like exactly, right? That's going to be crazy, right? Yeah. You know, I know some of y'all superstitious and don't want to live by a graveyard. You ain't got a Y'all, y'all walk. Don't walk across somebody's grave. It don't matter. They can't see it. <laughs> and all those superstitious stuff we used to do. Yeah. You ain't got to worry about a grave till Jesus come back. Yeah. Hmm? They not going to move. They don't stir. They don't go nowhere until what? He says, get up. However he's going to say it. Okay. Yes, sir. You know, this also contradicts what, uh, what people say about people dying and going home to heaven.
see, that part we haven't got to. We're going to deal with that extensively when we get in Revelation chapter number 20. Where are they at now? It's not heaven, it's not hell as we think it is, right? You know, I've read, and that's Greek words, right? Paradise, Hades is the whole realm of the dead, right? You got a section for what's called paradise, and you got a section called Tartarus, okay? And we'll get into that on the next occasion. I won't get too ahead of myself. But that's where the uh, the souls of man can go until the judgment day, also called the second coming. Yes, ma'am. I'm just so due to back off of Brother Mitchell when the baby was at the hospital. One nurse had said, Well, she's going to, if she happened to die, now be careful, be good to your brother. This type of thing. At the funeral, you brought it out. And we had amens, but then when you talked about it, it was quietness. <laughs> so you explain to those who thought, well, she sent up in heaven with God at this time. What I can say is this, though. When it comes to paradise, they're not suffering in any form or fashion. That's where you want to go. What did Jesus say to the thief on the cross? Today thou shalt be with me in paradise right after he died. So it's the best later on, which first you got to go what? From the Hadean world. And then get up, and then you rise to the heavenly glory. Okay, just keep it simple before we get there. Okay. All right, any other questions or comments? Very good. All right. So it's good that we sing that uh, song. I, I forget how all the lyrics go. We shall rise. That's scripture. That's true. That's true. All right, let me quick, keep going real quick. Let's run out of time. And I believe, like I said, we're going to have to stop here. We're not going to get to Revelation 20. Only the voice of Jesus is going to rise from the dead, right? Raised from the dead. And that's what scriptures are told, telling us, right? So again, those who would not listen to his voice in the Bible will audibly, audibly hear it anyway at the judgment day. So it's better to just listen now, right? So you have an opportunity to be saved where if you hear it on the judgment day and you're not saved, it's not a voice you want to hear, right? I want to hear what he's saying now that, what, greater love have no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I want to be a friend of Jesus because he'll never leave me nor forsake me, even on the judgment day. All right? Now, again, as I mentioned to you, the voice of Jesus is going to be irresistible. We're not going to be able to have some people say, oh, I'm going to stay in the grave. Right? <laughs> I don't care what you say. No, he said, oh, the dead. <laughs> I'm going to ride. Oh, I'm not coming out because you know somebody ain't going to be ready like, I ain't coming out. No. Mm -mm. I know what I'm about to face, right? You remember them? You remember those uh, demons when he when Jesus approached that man called Legion? Mm -hmm. What did them demons say? Mm -hmm. What did they want? They said, "Put us in the pigs." In other words, that would have been better than going at the time would have been Tartarus, right? They called it the abyss, all that kind of stuff, right? Back in those days, right? They didn't want to go to where Jesus could have sent them, so they went to the pigs. But it's still messed up because the pigs went in the sea and they died. So what do you think the demons would have went? <laughs> they went to punish them. <laughs> anyway, right? All they did was prolong what was going to happen to them anyway. Right? But what I'm getting at is that they knew the power of Jesus. They knew he was judge. They knew he was king of kings. They knew he was lord of lords. They knew he had power over them. And so that's why they went to beg when they encountered the Lord. Right? And that's what I'm saying now. You know, nobody can resist him. Even those demons can resist, right? Because Jesus could do whatever he wanted to do to them at that time. Okay. That makes sense to you? All right. All right. Now, the dead will take two paths into judgment. Right? Eternal life, which we know is you go to heaven. Or you go to hell, as we know it. Also called Gehenna in the Greek. All right. So it's either going to be eternal life or eternal damnation. There's nothing in between on the judgment day. Okay. All right. And of course, the Bible doesn't mention these things for no reason. Obviously, it teaches that he's the son of God, the various miracles he did from raising people from the dead. But it also teaches that what he did once, he can do again. Right? He gave us samples of the resurrection on earth. Look at the, the various people that he rose from the dead. J. Iris' daughter in Mark, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 21 and 23. The widow of Nain's son, he rose him from the dead in Luke chapter 7. 
verse 11 to 16. Lazarus, probably the most famous case, right? John chapter number 11, verse 1 to 46. He raised him from the dead after being four days dead. Okay? And of course, he raised himself. When you look at John chapter 2, verse 18 and 19, and chapter 10, verse 18, he also raised himself also. Okay? All right? Let's, let, uh, that makes sense to you? All right. Actually, I want to get that again. John chapter, yeah, because Revelation 20 is going to be next time, 11 to 15. But let's get John chapter 2, verse 18 and 19, and John 10, verse 18. I think those would be good notes to end upon. John chapter 2, verse 18 and 19. Let me see if I can get there with you. If somebody read those, I'll be the last two more in on those. Then after the Jews, they said unto him, How does it be saved? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise, raise it up. The temple was about. Right? What did he tell his enemies? His enemies, right? He said, What? Destroy this temple when I woke. Who did he say raise it? He said, I, me. I'm talking about himself, right? We'll raise it up. Okay? This is the power that he had. Okay? Within himself. All right? John 10, verse number 18. Let's read that again. I mean. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it, take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. All right, so he's talking about his life, right? Jesus, he said, no man taketh it from me, but I would lay it down of myself, right? I have power to lay it down, and I have what? Power to take it again, right? He had the power to what? Rise himself, raise himself from the dead, okay? All right, so I just wanted you to be able to see that. So if he could raise himself up, that's probably the biggest testimony of the resurrection, right? If a person can get themselves out of the tomb. After being there for three days, right? I know he can do it for me. And I know he can do it for you. Because why? That power was within himself. Okay? That's part of the divinity side of Jesus. Yes, he was fully human. Hebrews 4, 14, and 16. But he was God at the same time. And only God can bring about life, right? And so that's why he was in charge of the tomb. And that's some power. That's some eye-opening things if you think about that, right? Some of, some of us can't raise ourselves from the bed. <laughs> and he can get out of the tomb, huh? After being dead three days. That's hot. That's hot. All right, that's about all we can get in tonight. Uh, any last questions or comments before we move on? All right, if you want, study Revelation 20. And I'm specifically going to, con uh, uh, specifically that is, concentrate on verse 11 to 15 about the judgment. Of course, you know what your responsibility is. Be Acts 17, Christians, Bereans. That is, study behind me to see if these things are so. All right. Well, God bless you all. Good class. We'll go ahead and uh, we'll end it here. Let's get a, somebody give us a song we typically do, and I'll get us all gathered together in one group again, and we'll dismiss from there. God bless you. Good class. Everything's all right in my father's house. In
Father's house. To my Father's house. To my Father's house. Jesus is the way to my Father's house. Where there's joy. 